Hello, welcome to our Noontime webinar. I'm Dr. Jill Brooks, Senior Director of Education for First Healthcare Compliance. At First Healthcare Compliance, we're here to help you with a comprehensive compliance management solution tailored to your business, a hospital, a hospital network, healthcare practice of any size, billing company, or skilled nursing facility. As part of our complimentary educational webinar series, we bring you experts from around the country to discuss relevant topics in the healthcare industry. The subject of today's webinar, exclusion screening, is one that we have received numerous questions about, such as, what is this? Do I have to do screening and how often? What happens if I don't do exclusion screening? To better understand this subject, we have Christina Loiza of PreCheck presenting what healthcare employees should know about exclusion screening. PreCheck is one of our valued partners, providing services for healthcare organizations which include background verifications and credentialing, credentialing outsourcing solutions to handle professional license management, health and drug testing, exclusion and sanction screening, immunization tracking, and online I-9 and E-Verify processing. Christina is the project manager, the product manager for pre-checks drug testing, exclusion screening, and I-9 E-Verify compliance solutions. She uses her four years of experience at PreCheck to provide a unique perspective on the different aspects of product management, including product development, marketing, operations, and client support. Christina earned a bachelor's degree in international studies from the University of St. Thomas in Houston, Texas. This webinar will cover key guidance and regulations regarding exclusions, overview of exclusion lists publicly available, and the top best practices for exclusion screening. Before we begin the presentation, uh, you can see that a copy of her slides are available in the handout section on your control panel. Your PACOM CEU certificates will be automatically emailed to you within 24 hours. Please email questions directly to Christina after the presentation. Her contact information will be available on the last slide. Go ahead, Christina. Thank you so much, Jill, and thank you everyone for joining me today. So we're here to talk about healthcare exclusion screening, and before I continue on with the presentation, I do want to mention that the content that I'm presenting today does not constitute legal advice, whether it is expressed or implied. It is intended for informational services only, so please consult with qualified counsel for legal advice um, whenever it comes to your exclusion screening program. So very quickly, here is a snapshot of our agenda today. First, we'll be talking about exclusions, you know, what they are and how this affects the healthcare industry. Then we'll be going into the main sources for exclusion information, as well as, you know, just tidbits of information that you need to know when searching those exclusion lists. Finally, we'll be going through some of the best practices for an effective exclusion screening program. To start with, let's talk about exclusions and what they are. So the federal government has put a system in place in which sanctioned or excluded individuals are not allowed to either participate or receive payments funded through federal dollars. So in healthcare, this means that individuals or entities that have been excluded are not allowed to receive payment on services that are funded by Medicare, Medicaid, or any other federal healthcare program such as tri care or CHIP, among others. Whenever we are talking about healthcare exclusions, you will always come across the Department of Health and Services, Health and Human Services, excuse me, Office of the Inspector General. So we will be talking about who they are and what they do in later slides, but in talking about healthcare exclusions, you need to know that according to the OIG, that the effect of an exclusion is that no payment will be made by any federal health care program for any items or services that are furnished, ordered, or prescribed by an excluded individual or entity. So this payment prohibition applies to the excluded person, anyone who employs or contracts with that excluded person, really any hospital or any other provider for which that excluded person provides services and anyone else. Further, they say that the exclusion applies regardless of who submits the claim and applies to all administrative and management services furnished by the excluded person. And so the term exclusion, um, though technically different from a termination or debarment, which you'll see is 
quite often used interchangeably in this presentation. Um, you know, a termination generally refers to the party's inability to bill Medicaid or Medicare for services rendered. Um, debarments are generally a ban from, you know, someone to do something. A sanction is an action against a party. But regardless of what these may be called, they're often used synonymously in exclusion screening because they are an effective and involuntary removal of that party from participation in the respective programs. And so something to note is that excluded individuals are not necessarily prohibited from conducting business in the healthcare industry. And the guidance that the OIG provides through their special bulletin will actually confirm this but their options do become very limited whenever they want to conduct business with anyone receiving federal health care funds. And so ultimately, it is your responsibility as the provider that none of the payments coming from the government go to sanctioned individuals or entities. So this really means that you need to have a program in place to make sure that you're not employing or working with an excluded individual individual, or really you're risking civil monetary penalties that can be very costly to any company or provider. And so as we are talking about exclusion screening in the healthcare industry, you will find, um, in the, if you've experienced this before, of course, or have been in the industry, you will know that there are very many different lists that you are to check, whether it's required by the OIG or your regulator or the CMS for its providers or really any other state law that's out there. For the purposes of this presentation, we will focus largely on the OIG list of excluded individuals and entities, or otherwise known as the LEIE. We'll also be discussing SAM and other federal exclusion sources that um, are mostly pertaining to healthcare. And then we'll also be discussing state Medicaid termination lists. OK, so let's talk about the OIG LEIE. As I mentioned earlier in healthcare, the focus for compliance with regard to exclusions is directed by the Department of Health and Human Services Office of the Inspector General, or the OIG. So the OIG was established back in 1976, and through the Social Security Act, they were given the mission to protect the integrity of the Department of Health and Human Services programs. And one way they do this is through fighting waste and fraud from those participating in Medicare and Medicaid. The OIG spends a lot of their resources here because these two programs actually ensure about one in three Americans. It's a multi-billion dollar industry, and just because of its size, you know, its sheer size, it's highly susceptible to fraud. Now, fraud comes in many different forms, and uh, the OIG is really proud of the fact that they've recovered millions, even billions, through their investigations of overpayments, kickbacks, and other improper practices. So they've recently reported that they have um, recovered over $2.4 billion through these efforts. One of the ways that the OIG fights ex you know, waste is through exclusions. So this is their way to identify for everyone the parties who are not eligible to receive federal health care dollars. The OIG, they've been given the authority to exclude individuals and entities based on a certain criteria, and that's found on Section 1128 of the Social Security Act. And they come up with a list of these exclusions, and they make it available to the public through a list that they compile, again, that is called the List of Excluded Individuals and Entities. So OIG exclusions are categorized in two types, mandatory and permissive. And so mandatory exclusions carry a minimum of a five-year exclusion. And there are really four main reasons for a mandatory exclusion. The first one is for any individual or entity that's been convicted of a criminal offense that's related to the delivery of an item or service under the Medicare or Medicaid programs. Um, any individual or entities that has been convicted of a criminal offense that's related to patient abuse or neglect. Um, after HIPAA was put in place in 1996, there is also now the mandatory exclusion for any individual or entity that's been criminally convicted for an offense such as fraud or theft um, related to the delivery of a healthcare service or item that's financed um, by any federal, state, or local government agency. 
And then there's also any individual or entity that has been convicted of a criminal offense that consists of a felony relating to the unlawful manufacture, distribution, um, prescription, or dispensing of a controlled substance. And so as you will notice, these um, they will also have provisions, the OIG does, for mandatory exclusions if one were convicted on the grounds of multiple exclusions above. So if there were two two convictions of mandatory offenses, then it carries the minimum of a 10-year exclusion. That includes misdemeanor convictions for fraud, um, fraud in non-healthcare programs, license revocations, um, et cetera. There are currently 17 permissive exclusions that the OIG considers, and the full list is available here on the website that is shown on the bottom of the slide. Now, the minimum number of years that one can be excluded is different for each type of exclusion. And so um, if you need a reference, again, I just suggest that you go to this website here. Now, regardless of the type of exclusion, the effect is the same in that the individual or entity is not allowed to receive payments for goods and furnished, ordered, or prescribed from federal health care funds. At the end of the number of years of exclusion, whether it be five years or 10 years or more than that, reinstatement is not automatic, and any excluded party must go through a process to apply for a reinstatement before they can again participate in any of the programs. And so it is also not guaranteed that the OIG will reinstate a provider after that time has lapsed. And really, one of the reasons that they would deny someone to be reinstated would be because that provider was billing for services while they were excluded. And so that's just a big no-no. Any provider who does work with an excluded individual, you risk civil monetary penalties that can go up to um, over $10,000 per patient contract, contact. And so the CMP law was created in 1981, and it was really um, put in place in order to give the OIG a way to hold you know, providers, excluded individuals, accountable you know, after they've wronged the health and human services programs. Um, and sometimes criminal cases just aren't reasonable. And so many of the investigations do end up with settlements, and the amount can range pretty significantly as the CMPs you know, are not just a repayment of the overbilled service, there's also, of course, a penalty that's associated with it. So what you see here are just a few of the recent examples from 2016. In January of 2016, cardio specialists group um, from Illinois, they entered into a $274,000 settlement with the OIG after their investigation revealed that the excluded individual who was a medical biller, of course, provided services to CSG patients who were part of you know, federal health care programs. And then we have two um, in August that are both in Texas. LifeCheck um, entered into a $30,000 settlement with the OIG, and so it resolves an agreement or an it resolves an allegation that LifeCheck employed an excluded individual who was the store manager and the pharmacy technician. And then the Point Rehabilitation and Healthcare Center, again in Texas, entered into a $408,000 settlement because an office manager provided services to the Point patients while that person was excluded. And so the OIG does provide some guidance to providers about how to have an effective exclusion screening program. And again, they have many resources, um, one of which is the Special Advisory Bulletin on the Effect of Exclusions from Participation in Federal Health Care Programs. So this was originally created in 1999, but was recently updated. And so May 2013 is the most recent um, published item that's out there. If you haven't read this document, I highly recommend that you do so. It really um, answers a lot of questions about what the OIG expects out of everyone when it comes to exclusions, including you know, having some 
clear illustrations on who are excluded and what circumstances do the exclusions apply. So an obvious example, of course, of an excluded individual that's not allowed to receive health care funds would be a nurse providing direct care. So that is not allowed direct patient care. Um, you know, they cannot be this providing medicine or just really providing any type of service to a beneficiary of Medicare and Medicaid. So that's not allowed, and it's um, a violation of the OIG exclusion policies. Um, they also, again, provide great illustrations when one would consider you know, a violation even though the services were not provided directly. So if an excluded nurse, for example, prepares a surgical tray that was used on um, a covered beneficiary, then the violation is again there of the OIG exclusion mandate. So a pharmacy may be held liable if they fill the prescription that's written by an excluded physician. Or an administrator of the hospital, though in the management role and not directly involved with patient care, they cannot be an excluded individual either because the decisions that make you know, that they make high up does make an impact on the beneficiaries of these healthcare programs. And so one thing to note on the guidance is that it talks about the providers and that they are liable because especially, you know, whenever they know or should have known that they were working with an excluded individual. And so this is really where the need for monitoring comes in. Because while there's no specific law or regulation that requires a certain frequency for searching, the fact that you are required to know even after you've initially hired or contracted with that individual or entity, it makes the case for you to consider monitoring the list more frequently. So in the bulletin, the OIG makes the case for screening monthly as they update their information monthly as well. And so that just reduces the exposure in terms of you know, um, the time that has lapsed between when you first check that individual and when you check that individual again. So if you don't currently have a process in place for continuous monitoring, then really now is the time to consider that. So very quickly, we'll go into the actual process of screening individuals and entities in the LEIE. So whenever you perform exclusion screening, you really need to know your sources and know the kind of information that each of them holds. And so each source of data provides different ways in which they would show the information, different ways in which you can verify it. So it really um, makes a lot of sense to have a good handle of each of the sources that you are to screen. So with the OIG, the LEIE can be searched online. On the website, you can search by single name, multiple names, or by entity. And then whenever you search a name, the system will provide all of the matches based on the search criteria that you entered. And if you do get a name match on the OIG website, you can verify whether it is the same person or not by simply entering that individual social security number or an entity's federal employer ID number. The OIG also provides a download of all of the exclusions every month. And so they update right around the um, tenth of every month. And that can be imported into a data processing system that you may have internally. And you know, the goal is, of course, that it would help you identify name matches. So the download itself will not include social security numbers or the EINs for entities. So whenever you come up with name matches, you do need to make sure that you confirm those back on the website. So when you have a name match for Robert Smith, then you would go back, search for that information online, and then once again verify with the social or the EIN. On the OIG website, uh, they do provide some tips on how to best run your searches. And so they suggest you know, using name variations, flipping first and last names, um, only using the first two letters of the names. Um, again, they have a lot of tricks that you can use. So really what they want you to do is cast a wide net and consider the different ways, you know, one can use name variations, especially because, you know, bad actors do tend to hide the fact that they've been excluded because they want to continue working in the healthcare industry. So there are, again, just some tips in terms of widening the search and making sure that you're um, catching someone who may be trying to hide. 
Okay, so while the clearest requirement for exclusion in the healthcare industry is to check the OIG LEIE list, there are several other sources that you should be aware of, and they have varying degrees of requirement. And so you may have heard of SAM, which stands for System for Award Management. It includes several federal procurement systems that are now consolidated by the GSA under SAM. So whenever SAM was formed, it is also incorporated the formerly maintained excluded parties list system, which is the EPLS. Now SAM includes information on entities that are debarred, suspended, proposed for debarment, excluded, or disqualified for, from receiving federal contracts or certain subcontracts from certain types of federal financial and non-financial assistance and benefits. Now, SAM includes information. So on the EPLS side, whenever you're talking about exclusions, you're going to see that SAM has a lot of different federal agencies that are reporting to it. It actually also includes the OIG LEIE information, the, um, the exclusion or department lists from the Office of Personnel Management, you know, Department of Justice, Food and Nutrition Services, among others. Now, the effect of the exclusion in this list is to prevent government funds from being paid towards those on the list. Um, state Medicaid agencies are actually required to search this list whenever a provider enrolls and initially and um, monthly thereafter. And so some do extend that requirement to their providers. And again, this is why it's really important that you check with your legal counsel just to make sure that, you know, if you are in a state that requires that SAM be checked monthly as well, that you do have a system in place for that. The SAM database is available both as a search engine on SAM.gov or as a file download, which gets updated every day. And so while the search mechanism you know, provided in the SAM on the website is fairly easy to use, you just enter a name either on the quick search or the advanced search here. Um, verifying exclusions is a little bit more complicated than the OIG list. So because there are many different sources of exclusion information, there's actually some inconsistency in data in terms of how easily one could verify if the name match is the same as the person that's being searched. And for example, if I search for Robert Smith on the SAM website and I do a quick search, I will get 12 hits. And so when I click on the details on any one of those results, the system will allow me to verify by the address that they have on the file. The problem is um, whenever you're verifying whether or not you have the same person, the excluded individual is who you're searching, is that the SAM requires that whenever you verify, you have the exact information that they have on file. So. If I search at the address 100 Smith Street and I use 100 Smith ST period instead of spelling out S-T-R-E-E-T, -E -E that actually makes a big difference in whether or not I get a resulting match. Um, and the issue is that the system doesn't tell me, hey, you're getting close, you just need to you know, figure out how to spell street. It will just say that there's no match. And so it makes it seem like it's not the same individual when it actually is. I just didn't have the exact information that Sam needed in order to verify that information for me. And so, you know, what other thing that I can do is search with a social. And so the way that you would do that is through the advanced exclusion search. So you can search with both the social and the name. So the issue, though, is that not all SAM records do have a social on file either. So one may think that it's not their included individual when it is. The information, again, just was not at SAM. So it really makes sense that if you do have a name match, that you do look a little deeper, especially when you are checking SAM. So one thing that users may sometimes overlook about the SAM website is that they actually say um, on their statement here that you need to confirm origin, um, the information or any hits with the source of information. So they have a disclaimer that says, you know, please note that when matches are found, 
there may be instances where an individual or firm has the same or similar name as your search request, but is actually a different party. Therefore, it is important that you verify a potential match with a debarring agency identified in the record information. So SAM does provide you with contact information for the data sources. So whenever you do get a sanction or exclusion information from SAM, you really must check with a primary source. So go back to the first source of information so that you can get the most up-to-date information. And this is especially the case with OIG records. And the OIG actually recommended in their bulletin that whenever you do have a, a hit for an OIG record in SAM, then you must go to the OIG website to confirm that record. So moving on to other sources that most healthcare facilities need to check is um, the OFAC list, or sometimes known as the terrorist list. So OFAC stands for the Office of Foreign Asset Control, and they're responsible to administer and enforce you know, economic sanction programs against countries or groups or individuals that are you know, terrorists or drug traffickers. The goal here is to stop the flow of money to terrorist organizations or really drug traffickers. And as part of their enforcement, they publish a list of individuals and companies that are either owned, controlled, or known to be acting on behalf of targeted countries. Um, it also lists individuals or groups that are known drug traffickers. And collectively, these um, groups of individuals and companies are called specially designated nationals, or SDNs. And so their assets are blocked, and US persons are generally prohibited from dealing with them. Now, the OFAC publishes their list on the website. It is also available on SAM. So again, whenever you're checking um, the SAM record and you get an OFAC trash um, hit, then you do need to check this OFAC website to make sure that you have the most recent information. They have a search tool um, on their website that you can search for one name at a time. So it does employ some fuzzy logic on the name matches and provides you with a score on how close the hit is. Um, the OFAC also provides a downloadable list, much like the SAM and the OIG databases. They don't say how often they update it, but they say that they update the list, you know, pretty regularly. So you just, if you're downloading lists and putting it in your own system, you just need to make sure that you're checking all of these, um, you know, regularly as well. And so on the OFAC database, there's sometimes addresses that are provided. Um, the date of birth is provided at times as well, but I've seen some where it's just the year. So you can use those identifiers whenever you review the name matches to figure out whether or not your employee or your vendor is the one who is on the sanction or the OFAC sanction list. If you do get a hit, you are required to contact OFAC. Let them know of your findings and then, of course, not deal with those individuals if they are, in fact, the same person. So for those who are research facilities or conduct clinical trials, then the Food and Drug Administration's disqualification and debarment list would be familiar to you. So the FDA has the authority to disqualify or remove researchers from conducting clinical testing um, if they determine that the researcher is, you know, not following the rules that are intended to protect the subjects or ensure data integrity. They also can disqualify someone who is always providing false information in reports. So they also have a debarment um, procedure. And so for the FDA, whenever they debar someone, that means that that person may no longer work for anyone with an approved or pending drug product application. And so the FDA publishes their list on their website. It's not something that you can download. The list itself is not very long. And so it's a quick control F whenever you need to find your person's name. Um, notices are published. And so on the right-hand side with the 
information here, it will show the notices that they've published in the Federal Register. And you can search for more identifiers because there's not a lot of identifiers that are provided on the website itself. You really need to dig deeper into making sure that you are not, again, hiring someone who is disqualified or debarred by the FDA. So the way that you would do that is to go into the Federal Register um, or get the docket number. And then when you search for that docket number, um, you would get the actual document that you know, is sent to the employee that's telling them that they've been disqualified or debarred. And so address history is more, very important because you can get that information there. Um, you can get other information as well. Any unique identifier that will show that, you know, the name match on the FDA list is the same as the one that you're trying to hire is really what you're looking for whenever you're looking at all of these sources of information and digging deeper. Okay, so now we're going to move on to state Medicaid termination or exclusion lists. There are currently 37 um, states plus the District of Columbia who have made their exclusion or termination lists public. Now, they all have different ways to do this. They sometimes have a search engine on their website or sometimes they just have a link for a file download. Some have it in Excel, some have it in Word. Some have it in PDF. It really is all different, and they're all updated at different times. And so in order to maintain compliance and making sure that you're checking the state Medicaid lists, um, you will need to check all of the sources regularly. Now, the requirements for searching these termination lists varies, but there is a case to be made for screening all because of the new requirement from ACA, and we'll go into a little bit more detail um, in in my next slide here. So unfortunately, there is a misconception about these state Medicaid lists that, you know, because you search the OIG monthly, then you're covered with the state Medicaid lists. So unfortunately, that cannot be further from the truth. A lot of studies have shown that entries in state Medicaid lists are not shown on the OIG database. And so it could be the criteria for exclusion is different um, from what the OIG reports, or the state Medicaid just simply has not provided that information to the GSA so they can import it in their records. So there are many reasons that, um, again, there's a discrepancy in the information. But because of the Affordable Care Act, you are now, again, reasonably required to check all of those state Medicaid lists. So prior to the passage of the Affordable Care Act, the only requirement for Medicaid providers was really to check their state Medicaid list in addition to the OIG and the SAM. That changed in 2011 with um, Section 6501 of the Affordable Care Act, and that state Medicaid agencies um, need to check terminations in other state plans in order to really close the loop on continued participation um, of an excluded individual who just jumps from one state to another because they got excluded in one state. So while this talks about termination, again, for Medicaid programs and not specifically exclusions, you need to make sure that you do follow this as it affects an individual's ability to participate in healthcare programs. And so in 2015, the OIG conducted a study that showed that this is still not being followed. Um, the OIG found that 12% of providers terminated for cause in 2011 were still participating in other state Medicaid programs. And um, by January 2014, they found that that's already amounting to $7.4 million in overpayment. So again, um, in many letters that are sent to state Medicaid agencies, you know, from the director, it is saying that they do recommend that the states extend this requirement to the providers of that state. And so being ahead of the curve, you want to make sure that you do have a process in place for checking all of these state Medicaid records. So what do you need to know about exclusion? Exclusion screening. I have here just a few um, of the best practices that I do recommend whenever you have an exclusion screening program. So the first thing that you'll need to do is, of course, know which databases you are required to screen. That would be based on you know, your circumstances, regulations that you'll need to follow, or any other screening requirements. 
I highly recommend that you work with legal counsel as requirements can significantly change from one state to another, from one regulator to another. The next one is once you have your sources identified, um, you need to know again what your sources are and have a procedure written down for each of the sources because they do have different ways in which you verify and in which you search the information, um, you need to have a good documentation down so that you know what steps to take anytime you have a hit from OIG, every time you have a hit from SAM. Um, you also need to have, of course, you know, a, a directory pretty much of who you can contact whenever there are name matches, but you can't quite resolve who they are. So the point of my third um, bullet here is that the point of screening is to minimize civil monetary penalties. And so you will need to consider screening your employee population or your vendor population as often as you can in order to identify, first and foremost, if you are working with an excluded individual and, again, have the least amount of exposure possible. So while many requirements out there are that you check these exclusion databases just at the time of hire or appointment or contract, um, that only takes care of a person coming in the door. Exclusions can still happen at any time after that, so it really does benefit providers to screen frequently after the initial time. So again, the OIG recommends screening the LEIE monthly because they update their information on a monthly basis. Um, some state Medicaid do require um, their own providers to check LEIE and SAM and the state Medicaid uh, monthly as well. And so for your compliance program, you will need to determine the frequency at which you screen the sources, but do consider, again, um, doing it more frequently than annually um, even because you want to, again, narrow down the, um, the exposure for which the, an excluded person may be working for you. Next is that you need to search name variations for each individual. And so in addition to the name that you call your employee, you'll also need to look through aliases and, again, other possible name matches or name variations. If you know of an alias name for your employee, then you'll need to search that as well. So you may consider switching the first and last names during your search to see if you come across a name match or searching each last name for those with a hyphenated name. So again, the goal is to cast a wide net in order to catch someone who may have used a name variation, again, in hopes of not being detected as one who is a sanctioned or an excluded individual. And next is that one thing that you would know if you have been doing exclusion screening before is that the names do tend to multiply. And whenever, what I mean with that is, again, um, whenever you search these databases, whenever there are name matches, there's a high likelihood that you would get multiple results back. And again, with Robert Smith, whenever I searched that on SAM, I got 12 hits. And so you do need to thorough thoroughly, excuse me, review each of these hits. Um, not all of them would refer to the same person, and so you do need to have a good process in place in order to handle this, these name matches. And so this is really when having a good amount of unique identifiers on an individual becomes very helpful. Um, social security numbers can be used to verify from the OIG websites, some on the SAM, and some state Medicaid lists like Texas, New York, or Louisiana. Um, the DOB, or date of birth, or the NPI number, or residency history can also be very helpful. But of course, you need to have that information available to you whenever you're doing sanction screening. I know there's a large push, I mean, on the other side of things where you want the least amount of information as possible for these um, employees or, you know, entities that you work with, but you do need to consider, again, in terms of sanction screening, the more unique identifiers that you have, the better you'll be in terms of having name matches be conclusive um, in your research. 
there's also, I mean, as you're reviewing a lot of these names, there's a lot of benefit in having someone who is dedicated in reviewing the name matches and determining, you know, which match is a false positive or an actual match. So you could potentially work with many hits on your initial search, and so you do need to do the legwork in making sure that you're not hiring someone who is an excluded individual. Document, document, document. I'm sure this is something that's already been ingrained in everyone's um, policies, but it really does help. There are times um, when the lack of identifiers will leave you in doubt whether or not the name on the exclusion is the name of your employer entity. And so whenever you reach out to the data source, they may not necessarily respond right away. So this is why it will be important to have a, a, a really good documentation process in place. You know, you'll need, whenever there is an audit, you'll need to be able to demonstrate that you did everything that you could in order to not hire someone who is excluded. excluded. And so screenshots, um, timestamps, process documentations will go a very long way whenever there is question, again, of why you ended up hiring someone who was excluded. If you do find that you hired or are working with someone who is excluded, you'll need to get with legal counsel, ASAP. There are you know, reporting guidelines that may differ by state, and so you'll also need to consider whether or not you want to go through the OIG self-disclosure protocol. So the OIG has a way for facilities or providers like you to disclose whether um, when you find out that you have hired someone who is excluded. Now, while this doesn't absolve your facility or company um, from any liability, it's generally seen as um, something of a more favorable approach um, rather than getting investigated by the OIG and being fined um, without you, again, self-disclosing. So again, that decision, though, is something that you would need to make with legal counsel. And so just know that it is something that is available to you. And you would weigh your options with your counsel about you know, the, the specifics of the actual case at hand. And so if you feel overwhelmed by this topic, know that you are not alone. So exclusion screening involves so many different government agencies, and sometimes it can be hard to figure out what you need to do in order to be compliant. So the great thing is that there are so many tools that are available for you to get your information. The OIG hosts a lot of great resources. They are very open to questions, and sometimes they even you know, recommend that you, if there's ever any question, you know, write to them, send them a question, and they'll help you with that. Um, webinars such as these do help in at least you know, guiding you through the questions that you need to ask your colleagues or your legal counsel. And then there are also services, you know, provide, service providers that can help you navigate through all of the sources. And so use all of these tools and don't be afraid about what you will find. The OIG says this too, a good compliance program is one that identifies issues. And so once you've done that, then you have the ability to resolve the issues and then move forward better than you were yesterday. And so I know exclusion screening, again, can be complicated, but there are so many ways in which you can have a good understanding of it and be confident in the program that you have in place going forward. So with that, I am thanking you for your time. If you do have additional questions, my contact information is on the screen here. And so you may call me directly or send me an email at any time. I am happy to provide you with as many information as I possibly can. And so, Jill, I am sending it back over to you. All right, well, thank you so much. Thank you, Christina. And again, uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, her contact information is there on the screen, or if you send us questions, we will forward them to her. Your CEU certificate will be sent directly to you following the broadcast. Our next webinar is on October 25th. UPIC is coming soon with Stephen Bittinger. This will be at 12 noon Eastern Standard Time. This webinar is also approved for CME. Uh, we are also hosting another webinar on November 1st. Uh, it will be from the FBI on assessing pre-attack behavior in an active shooter situation. Again, that's November 1st at 12 noon. 
You can register for these webinars or request a demo on our website at 1STHCC.com or call us at 888-543-4778. Thank you very much and have a great day.